chapter 18, Animals. And this, happily for you, I'm sure, is the last chapter of Biology 123. So when you start 124, you'll actually pick up, should pick up in chapter 19, you'll go from here in the same textbook. Um, but of course, be sure to turn your textbook in after this class is over. You'll have to recheck it out for Biology 124. I thought I'd mention that because a lot of students do make that mistake. Um, okay, so chapter 18, the end of 123, getting ready to lead you into 124 where you'll talk more about plants and animals. Of some 1.7 million species of organisms known to science, 1.3 million are animals, and animal life is incredibly diverse. And it arose as, a natural, as natural selection shaped animal adaptations to Earth's diverse and changing environment. So there are some, there's some animals that we consider kind of weird. They don't really fit into any category um, just perfectly. Some examples are monotremes and marsupials, which we will talk about. Classifying animals isn't always easy. Sometimes animals look like they should belong in certain categories, but because of some of their adaptations, they don't. Um, we have an example here. This is called a platypus, a duck-billed platypus. And if you look at it right offhand, it kind of looks a little bit like a bird because it has a beak. And then we see that it, that it has fur, though. And birds don't have fur. They have feathers. So that means it's not a bird. Then the other weird thing that we throw in is that it has, it lays eggs, which is also not something that mammals do, but this is a mammal. Um, a mammal like, like a human is a mammal, and we'll talk about what makes a mammal a mammal, but mammals don't lay eggs. So why do we consider this a mammal? Well, it's a special type of mammal called a monotreme, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we get closer to the end of this chapter, so kind of hold that thought. This is a picture, too, um, of an animal that is no longer around anymore. This, this um, is what was referred to in the first slide as a Tasmanian tiger. Tasmanian tiger, very pretty animal that's not around anymore. And this is a marsupial called a kangaroo. We all know that this is a kangaroo, and kangaroos, um, are called marsupials specifically because they carry their young in little pouches, right? So we'll talk about what makes a marsupial as well as we move through the chapter. So first, what is an animal in general? Animals are eukaryotic, multicellular heterotrophs that ingest their food. So let's take a look or break that down and see what that really means. Um, eukaryotic, we know that means they have cells that have a nucleus, multicellular in that they are made up of a lot of different cells, and heterotrophs, meaning we have to eat our food. Our food is not made inside of our bodies. We have to eat it. Here's an example of how animals eat. This is a quite vivid and sort of graphic example of that. But we can see this constricting snake eating an entire, what looks to be an entire deer, which is actually pretty impressive. I would imagine that this guy, once he finishes this meal, will not have to eat for probably a matter of months. Most animals are invertebrates, which means they don't have a vertebral column, no, no vertebrae, no bones. Um, and an example of this would be something like an insect or a worm. We know that they don't have backbones, they don't have rib cages, um, they're just kind of squishy, and some of them actually have hard shells, like some insects. So an invertebrate lacks a vertebrae or lacks a vertebral column. Um, and this might have been one of um, the the world's earliest invertebrates. Um, this is a picture. Um, of what we think might have been what some of the first invertebrates looked like in the ancient seas. Kind of looks like a giant bug. That would be quite scary to run into as you're scuba diving there. We can see some other examples of little invertebrates, kind of like little aquatic insects. Animals can be characterized by basic features of their body plan. 
Animal body plans vary in symmetry. Um, some animals have what we call radial symmetry, which means their body parts radiate from the center, like a starfish. Um, the, the starfish's main body is at the, in the middle and all the legs come off of that body. So they are radial or circular in their symmetry. Bilateral symmetry means that we have a mirror left and right, mirror image left and right side. We have an anterior and posterior end, which means um, a front and a back. And we also have a dorsal and ventral surface, dorsal being the back part of your body and ventral being your front part. Um, and we, we, have a, we have a head and a tail region, depending on what animal is. Um, of course, we don't have a tail, but we do have a tail bone. So we'll take a look at radial symmetry versus bilateral symmetry. So in this picture here, this is radial symmetry, okay? And radial symmetry is where the body is at the middle, and then we have all these little body parts coming off of that middle axis, like this, like these little tentacles coming off of that middle axis, radial or circular in symmetry. Bilateral symmetry is when the left and right side is a mirror image of each other, like us. If we were to be cut in half, we have an arm on the left and an arm on the right, a leg on the left and a leg on the right, an eye on the left and an eye on the right, and so on and so forth. We are bilaterally symmetrical. Sponges are the simplest of all animals. They are sessile, and sessile is a fancy word for stationary. They don't move. They stay where they are. And the majority of sponges are marine, meaning they live in the ocean or salt water. Some are found in fresh water. This is a picture of a type of sponge. Here's another one and another. Cnidarians are radial animals with tentacles and stinging cells. Cnidarians have radial symmetry. Okay, so this is a picture of a cnidarian. So this cnidarian, we can see, has the radial symmetry. It's kind of circular in shape. It's got a middle body part with these tentacles coming off of it, and those tentacles can sting. It's called a cnidarian. Here's another one. This one you're very familiar with. This is a jellyfish, and this jellyfish also has radial symmetry, meaning it's circular in shape and has body parts coming off of that center axis, which are these tentacles that are stinging, that have stinging cells. Here's another one. Cnidarians are carnivores. Um, we know that carnivores are meat eaters and they use their tentacles to capture their prey and push it into their mouths. They have what's called a gastrovascular cavity. Um, their mouth is the only opening they have and they circulate fluid inside that serves the internal cells. They circulate fluid um, that keeps the cells nourished. And cnidocytes are their stinging cells that are found on their tentacles, and they actually help them to defend themselves and capture their prey. And this will give you a view of how they do that. So here we have a cnidarian, like a jellyfish, okay, and here are the tentacles. And if we take one tentacle and we kind of blow it up a little bit, we can see where the tentacles have these sharp little stinging cells that are coming out of them, okay? So if we have, <clears throat> here's our cnidarian here, okay? So we're gonna take that, this picture of the cnidarian and bring it down a little bit more. And what they do is they shoot out these stinging cells and they can wrap them around their prey and those stinging cells then stab into the organism that they're trying to kill or feed on, and then they're able to absorb um, that kill into their mouth part, into their body, and they're able to then begin to digest it. So they just shoot out these stinging tentacles, these stinging cells, and they're able to puncture whatever prey they're trying to ingest and 
sting them, which can either incapacitate or paralyze that prey, and then they're able to feed on it and begin to digest it. Flatworms are the simplest bilateral animals. These guys have bilateral symmetry like we do. They're thin, ribbon-like animals. They have a gastrovascular cavity with one opening, okay, so they're able to feed through this gastrovascular cavity. There, there are marine, freshwater, and damp terrestrial habitat um, <clears throat> that they live in, and they're free-living types and parasitic types. Now when we say damp terrestrial habitat, terrestrial means earth, so on the earth, not necessarily in the water. So maybe um, damp areas like little um, tiny wet areas like inside of a ditch maybe where there's a collection of water that stays around for a large part of the year. It's not necessarily a pond or a stream, but it's where water collects during wet times of the year and these things could potentially survive in that. And they are also either free living or parasitic. parasitic. So we'll take a look at that too. Um, free living flatworms, these guys just live it. They live in the water, whether it's marine or fresh, and they don't have to live off of another organism like a parasite. Um, they have a very simple nervous system, and they have cilia, which are little finger-like projections on their underside, on their chest area, that they use to crawl. Now there are some that are parasitic, like the fluke, blood flukes. These are parasitic in, in other animals. They must have a host that they live off of, and they do this by attaching to their host using suckers. So let's look at, look at an example. This is a flatworm here, okay? And we talk, keep talking about a gastrovascular cavity, so let's take a look at what that means. Flatworms are very simple, okay? So this is a flatworm here, and it's got kind of an arrow-shaped head with two little eye spots and a very flat, ribbon-like body. They're very simple. They're invertebrates, um, and running through the main bulk of their body is what's called a gastrovascular cavity. This is where they can take in nutrients, like almost like a stomach, which is where the gastro part comes from, and vascular is how they deliver nutrients to the rest of their body, like blood vessels. We would call them blood vessels in humans or other more complex animals. So it delivers nutrients and um, oxygen to the body through this gastrovascular cavity. Very simple, no bones, no major organs, just what we call a gastrovascular cavity. And these can live freely in the water or some of them actually have to have a host that they live inside of where they suck themselves to the host and feed off of the host, whether that's by drinking blood or by just absorbing nutrients from that particular host, like some of the parasitic organisms that live in the intestine do. And we're going to get to those now. Um, tapeworms, I'm sure you guys have heard of tapeworms before. Tapeworms are, um, they can come in different forms. There are many different types. There are beef tapeworms and pork tapeworms, and they're called that because that's where we can get them from, by eating undercooked beef or pork, which is why we consider it quite dangerous or taking on a risk when we eat raw meat. Um, <clears throat> tapeworms have long ribbon-like bodies with repeating units that contain reproductive structures. Um, tapeworms look kind of like a tape measure, which is where they get their name from. And tapeworms are made up of segments, and each one of those segments contains reproductive organs. This is why um, if a tapeworm breaks in pieces, those individual pieces can grow new tapeworms, okay? So when we, um, if we get a piece of meat that's been ground up into ground beef or ground pork and we don't cook it all the way through and there's pieces of tapeworm in it, just one of those pieces can become an adult tapeworm. We only need one little piece because each piece contains reproductive structures. They don't have a digestive tract and they absorb food across the body surface. That means that they live in your intestines 
and they just absorb nutrients through their body. That's all. They just absorb nutrients from your food. So you're eating, but you're not getting all the nutrients because you're sharing them with the tapeworm, which is why they can become dangerous to you after a period of time. Tapeworms specifically are parasitic on vertebrates. Um, they like humans. They like mammals. Um, they live in partially digest. They live on partially digested food in the intestine of the host. Um, so what happens normally is we eat, if we eat undercooked meat um, and we get a piece of a tapeworm, what will happen is that tapeworm, um, once it goes through our stomach and gets into our intestine, it will actually bite into your intestinal wall, which you don't feel, and then it begins to grow while it's in your intestines. And it lives by sucking nutrients out of your food. Um, so many people that have a tapeworm don't know, and they begin to lose weight, unexplained weight. Um, they can lose weight rapidly, and they're not trying to diet. They just begin to lose weight and for unexplained reasons. And unfortunately, very disturbingly, tapeworms can get to be so long that they can fill up your entire intestines and then emerge out of your body. Um, one day when you go to use the bathroom, a tapeworm can actually appear. And this is how some people end up finding out that they have one. Um, so some tapeworms have been clocked out at um, 50 to 60 feet in length. Okay, so these are, this is quite a disturbing thought to have, but they're parasitic. And, and we've been saying parasitic when we started talking about flatworms, and now we're talking about tapeworms. But a parasite is something that must live off of another living thing, must live off of a host. Um, and typically parasites take as much from their host as they can without killing their host. Because if a tapeworm or a parasite kills its host, then what will happen to the parasite? It will die too. So this way, um, any smart parasite is going to take what it can without killing its host because it too would die if its host dies. So this is a picture of a tapeworm um, and you can see how incredibly huge it can get. This is the head of the tapeworm here. And if we blow that up, this is what a tapeworm's face looks like. And it has these things um, that look kind of like hooks. And those little hooks actually hook into your intestinal lining and then the tapeworm begins to grow. And this shows you how the segments look. So these are little segments of a tapeworm. You can see why it's called a tapeworm. And each one of those segments has male and female reproductive parts which is why you only need one segment in some meat that you're eating and you can develop a tapeworm just from that one segment. So moving up the line, we'll move into mollusks. Mollusks are very, have a variation on a common body plan. Um, they have bilateral symmetry too, where their left side looks just like their right side and they have a complete digestive tract. When we talk about mollusks, we're talking about shellfish, like um, talking about things like, excuse me, clams or um, oysters, things like that, mollusks or snails. Um, and they have a muscular foot and a big mass, kind of a body mass that contains most of its internal organs. Okay, so we'll take a look at that. Um, gastropods are the biggest group of mollusks and they include the snails and slugs. And they live in freshwater, salt water, and also on land. Um, that's what terrestrial, remember that means earth, on land. Most are protected by a single spiral shell and many have a distinct head with eyes at the tips. Like this little snail here. So this is a mollusk. And this, of course, is not a shellfish. It's a gastropod, more specifically. I should have been more clear about that. Um, here's another picture. This is a sea snail. Very pretty in color. Some of these guys are very poisonous, though, so you wouldn't want to touch it. Bivalves have shells that divide into two halves that are hinged together. These are our shellfish, like clams, oysters, mussels, and scallops. And a lot of these guys feed by filtering through gills. 
Um, they have gills like kind of like fish, and they suck um, they suck water through those gills, and they're able to feed and exchange gases with those gills, like oxygen and CO2. Uh, most of them are sedentary. Sedentary is another fancy word that means they don't move around. Okay, so sessile or sedentary are both words that mean they don't do a lot of moving around. This is a picture of a, um, this is actually a scallop. So if you like to eat scallops, this might change your mind a little bit because they certainly are not very attractive when we see them like this. Um, and it's called a bivalve. Bi meaning two because it's got two uh, it's got a hinged shell, two sides to it, the bottom and the top, and it filters water through and is able to absorb nutrients and oxygen through there. Um, you see these little blue things here? Those are eyes. Each one of those is an eye, which also makes it look so delicious. Makes you want to have scallops, doesn't it? Cephalopods are adapted to be fast, agile pred predators, and these guys are squids and octopus, um, different types of octopus. And the mouth is at the base of its foot. It uses a beak-like jaw to rip its prey open, and all have large brains and very sophisticated sense organs. The giant squid is the largest of all of these inver of all invertebrates. So here's a picture of a squid. You can see that it has very large eyes, and this is its head, okay? And down here are its tentacles. Its little beak would be embedded within those tentacles. And there's an octopus. Very strong animals, very muscular. Leeches are found in fresh water, and there are some marine ones and some terrestrial types that live on land in damp environments. Most are free-living carnivores, but some are parasitic and they like to drink blood. Um, and this is what most people think about when they think about leeches. Um, a blood-sucking leech cuts the skin with razor-sharp jaws and secretes an anesthetic and an anticoagulant, which is actually quite sophisticated. Um, an anesthetic is a deadener. Um, this is like what's used during surgery. It deadens your flesh so that you're not in pain. So a leech actually puts an anesthetic into your skin when it bites you so that you don't feel it. That way it can be sneaky about sucking your blood and you don't know about it. An anticoagulant means it prevents your blood from clotting. So you keep freely flowing blood through the incision site so that it can keep drinking your blood without worrying about your blood clotting. As creepy and nightmarish as this sounds, um, because of these things, leeches can be used medically to remove blood from bruises or relieve swelling when appendages are reattached. So you've probably heard of medicinal leeches, and these are leeches that are grown sterilely um, in, in a farm, farmed environment. These are not leeches that doctors pull out of a swamp. Um, if a person um, has had a limb detached or a finger detached, um, what they can do is if, if someone's thumb has been cut off, for example, they reattach the thumb and then they have the leech suck blood on the new um, on, on where they reattached the limb or thumb and in question this being the thumb. And what this does is by the leech secreting anticoagulant into the reattached body part, this will stimulate blood flow to the reattached body part and actually help that limb to get good blood flow and, and help with the healing process. Now, how people sit there and just let that leech suck their blood is pretty amazing. Even though we know it's um, going to help, it still must be a very disturbing sight to have a leech sucking on your blood and not doing anything about it. Arthropods are segmented animals that have jointed appendages and what's called an exoskeleton. An arthropod is um, a fancy way of saying an insect. Um, 
what we often call insects. And an insect is a, is a more specific definition, which we'll actually get to in a minute, but an insect is a type of arthropod. Um, not all arthropods are insects, um, just to clarify, but when, when most people think of arthropods, they're usually thinking about insects. Um, and we'll get into what makes an insect an insect and what makes an arthropod an arthropod. Um, Arthropods are segmented animals that have jointed appendages, so joints um, on their arms and legs, and an exoskeleton. So if, if you, as a human, have an endoskeleton, what do you think an exoskeleton is? So an endoskeleton is, is a skeleton on the inside of the body like we have. An exoskeleton is a skeleton on the outside of the body, a shell, like bugs have, like insects have. Um, or like crabs, lobsters, things like that as well. Various adaptations have made arthropods the most successful animals on Earth. They have jointed arms and legs that are adapted for different functions. They have an exoskeleton that is an external skeleton that protects and provides attachment points for muscles. And they have three distinct segments. They have a head, a thorax, which is the middle section, and the abdomen, which is the rear end section. Okay, so I mentioned before that a lot of times when we hear arthropod, we think of an insect, um, but not all arthropods are insects. Here, this is um, um, this is a lobster, or it, and it could all it also looks similar to what we call crawfish, which are all really known as crayfish. Um, so a lobster, a crawfish, um, a crab would all also be arthropods. They have a shell on the outside. And there are three regions. We have the head, we have the middle piece, which is the thorax, and then we have the tail, or the abdomen. Sure are tasty things, aren't they? So crustaceans are... Um, nearly all aquatic, and these include specifically, th this particular type of arthropod includes lobsters, crabs, shrimp, and barnacles, which is what we were just looking at here. Okay, so here's another example of a crustacean. And you know those barnacles are what um, grows all over docks and boats, anything that's still for a certain period of time. Barnacles grow um, on the bottom surface of boats and around docks and piers in the ocean, and barnacles would be considered crustaceans. Insects are the most diverse group of organisms. And they have a number of common features, um, a three-part body, just like we mentioned before when we talked about arthropods, um, consisting of a head, thorax, and abdomen. The head usually has antenna and eyes, and the mouth parts are used for particular kinds of eating. We have um, three sets of legs and one or two pairs of wings, but not all insects have wings. So here is a typical insect, and we have a head with eye and mouth parts and antenna. We have the thorax, which is the middle section, and then we have the abdomen. Echinoderms have a spiny skin, an endoskeleton, which is a skeleton on the inside, right, and a water vascular system for movement. Echinoderms are slow-moving or sessile marine animals, and they include organisms like sea stars, which are what we used to call starfish, but sea stars is more correct terminology, and sand dollars and sea urchins. The adults are radially symmetrical, and they have external bumps or spines that are extensions of their hard endoskeleton. So here is um, a sea star, and we can see the main part of its body is at the middle, and it has arms coming off of that main part of its body. This is why we call it radial, radially symmetrical. And this is a view um, of the bottom of a starfish, and it's using its little tube feet to pull a, a little, it looks, looks like a little clam, um, into its mouth part because it's trying to eat, break open the clam with its mouth and eat the inside. Here's another example 
of a um, <clears throat> of one of these echinoderms that we were just looking at. So this is a sea urchin. These are these are little guys you do not want to step on because they are very sharp and spiny. Vertebrates. Okay, so we're moving from invertebrates into vertebrates. Vertebrates um, have obviously a vertebrae, okay, a, a vertebral column, a backbone, and they also have a brain, head, vertebral column, jaws, legs, and amniotic eggs, okay. Um, so the brain of course is the, the large sense organ and then, then we have the vertebral column we talked about the, the vertebrae and then um, legs now depending on what kind of animal we're talking about many animals we're going to be talking about are what are called tetrapods tetra being four so four-legged animals and then we would be a biped we have two legs Lampreys are vertebrates that lack hinged jaws, and they represent the oldest living lineage of vertebrates. They feed in freshwater streams, and they have a jawless mouth with a rasping tongue. Okay, so I'm going to show you how these guys eat. It's also very disturbing. Um, the vast majority of, vertebra majority of vertebrates have a jaw. Um, that's two-part jaw connected by a hinge like we do. We have hinged jaws. Lampreys do not have hinged jaws. So this is a lamprey. It's quite ugly. It looks very much like an eel, but it's not an eel. Okay, It has a backbone, which we talked about. And this is a lamprey's mouth. Very, very disturbing looking mouth there. And there's no jaw. And what lampreys do is they actually suction onto um, the body of whatever it is it wants to feed on, like like mostly fish is what it's going to eat. And it suctions that mouth onto the side of a fish and it begins to um, secrete enzymes into the fish and the fish begins to dissolve slowly from the inside out. And the lamprey sucks the juices out of the fish as it's beginning to dissolve. So it's not a very quick death. It's it's quite horrific for the fish actually, but it just it, it's like a leech in a way. It just sucks juices out of whatever it's feeding on, namely fish, and it does not have a jaw. Jawed vertebrates with gills and paired fins include sharks, ray-finned fishes, and lobe-finned fishes. So there are three lineages of jawed vertebrates with gills and paired fins, which we call fish. Um, and one type of fish that we call, specifically we usually talk about sharks, are called chondrichthians. Okay, and anything chondro means cartilage, cartilage. Sharks and rays are made up of cartilage. They have a skeleton that is completely cartilaginous. It's very flexible. Unlike us, we have bony skeletons. Um, <clears throat> chondrichthians, or sharks and rays, have changed little in 300 million years. And this includes the sharks and rays. They have a very flexible skeleton made of cartilage and what's called a lateral line made up of sensory organs, or lateral line that works as a sensory organ, excuse me. So here's a shark. Um, we can see that it does it certainly has a skeleton, but the skeleton is entirely cartilage. And it has, you can kind of see a line running right here along its side. That's the lateral line. And it actually picks up on vibration in the water so the shark can feel when a fish is struggling um, or something's going on nearby. The shark can pick up on those vibrations. That lateral line acts as a sense organ. It can pick up on sensations. The ray-finned fish include familiar fish to us like tuna, trout, and goldfish. And they have a skeleton that's made up of calcium phosphate, just like us, a hard calcified skeleton. They also have a perculi, or if we're talking about one, an operculum, that moves water over the gills. Um, and I'll show you what the operculum is in just a second. You've seen it a million times, you just may not have known 
though that was what it was called. It has a swim bladder that helps it to float through the water. Lobe finned fishes have muscular fins supported by bones. And these lineages, the sharks, the ray finned fish, and the lobe finned fish, have given rise to terrestrial, this is a, of course according to the theory of evolution, they have given rise to terrestrial or land vertebrates. So we saw the shark, this is the ray finned fish, <coughs> and this is a trout, okay? And this right here, what I'm pointing at, this, that's right over the gills, kind of a hard flap, and we often see it moving on a fish, kind of like this whenever it's moving those gills. Um, that little hard flap that covers the gills, that's the operculum, okay? And we can see the lateral line going down the fish where it can pick up on sensations. It has one too, just like a shark. So in this picture here, there's the operculum that covers the gills. You can see its fins. And it also has a vertebrae. And if you've ever eaten a fish fillet, you know that there's bones in it. Um, well, usually the fillets don't have bones, but when we eat, go and eat a whole fish, like a catfish, there's often uh, bones in there. Amphibians were the first tetrapod. Remember, tetrapod means four legs. <coughs> Excuse me. They're vertebrates with two pairs of limbs, two arms, two legs. They were the first tetrapods that moved on land, and these guys are called, these guys include salamanders and frogs. Okay, so here is a, an example of an amphibian. Okay, and this shows that amphibians, amphibians can live between water and land. Um, that's, as we know, frogs, when frogs are first born, they're little tadpoles and they, they live in water and then as they begin to grow up and develop, then they begin to move on to land. But they always can return to the water when they need to and they do need to be near moisture. So they kind of live in between, which is a hallmark of an amphibian. Amphibians are, um, they do have an endoskeleton. We can see the vertebrae and all the bones. This is a, a little salamander. Um, and amphibians, like this might look to you like a lizard, but there's a big difference between a lizard and a salamander. Um, one of the major things that is easy to remember is lizards are not moist like this because they're not amphibians. They don't have to be moist. They're not slimy. <coughs> they have claws and they also have scales. That's one of the big things. And this is a smooth skin. This is not scales. Okay, so salamanders have smooth, slimy skin. They do not have scales like a lizard. The double life of amphibians refers to the metamorphosis part, like what frogs go through. Um, the larval stage or the young stage of a frog is the tadpole, which lives in water. These tadpoles are legless, aquatic algae eaters that have gills, a lateral line, and a long finned tail. And when frogs develop into adults, they become terrestrial insect eaters, meaning they live on land and they eat insects. They have four legs and air breathing lungs. Most amphibians are found in damp habitats where their skin functions in breathing. So frogs and other amphibians actually can breathe through their skin. And amphibian skin sometimes contains poison glands that function in defense. Um, I can give you an example of this. Um, many toads, bullfrogs, um, well not toads, but bullfrogs. Bullfrogs are the brown kind of, um, actually the bullfrog, bullfrogs are not brown. They're, they can be brownish, but they're usually um, the larger species, they, they're kind of, they can be green. Depends on what kind of bullfrog we're talking about. But the toads around here, which are not, which the scientific name is Bufus americanus, um, the toads that are around here are the brown, real warty looking frogs. Um, and they're, they're safe to pick up. Um, they won't bother you. But right behind the toad's eyes are some glands that produce a toxin or a poison. And if something like a dog or a cat gets a toad in its mouth, um, one of the defenses of that toad is it will secrete that poison behind its 
eyes, and if it gets in the dog or cat's mouth, the dog or cat begins foaming at the mouth. Um, it makes them feel, their mouths feel very uncomfortable, and it can also make them delusional. Um, and in the past, there have been people who, in order to get a cheap high, um, actually would thump those glands on the toad and then lick them. I know, God forbid, that is the most disgusting thing I've ever heard too. But they would thump those glands, get them to produce the toxin, and then lick them, which gives them a very short-lived high. Please know I'm not giving you any ideas. I do not recommend that in the least bit. Um, because you have to lick a frog to get it. I don't think that's worth it at all, but it does give you a little bit of that psychedelic feeling. Um, and so people that didn't have money to buy other psychotropic drugs would actually do this. Um, so it doesn't hurt you to touch it, but it's certainly not something you want to get in your mouth. Um, <clears throat> here is a tadpole that's beginning to turn into an adult. It started developing legs and arms. And there's an adult frog. Reptiles are amniotes. They hatch from eggs and they um, are tetrapods. They have four legs with a terrestrial adapted egg, meaning their eggs can survive on land. Amphibian eggs we find in water. Frog eggs, salamander eggs, they're, they're in water because the young are going to start out swimming. And reptiles, um, have eggs that can can develop on land and reptiles include lizards snakes turtles crocodiles now scientists are saying birds and a number of extinct groups such as dinosaurs the major derived characteristic of the group that's what clade means the group containing reptiles and mammals is the amniotic egg um, the embryo develops within a protective fluid filled sac which we call the egg and this enables reptiles to complete their life cycle on land. They don't have to survive in water. So this is a reptile, of course, this is a snake. Reptile adaptations for land life, terrestrial life, include scaly, waterproof skin that keeps the body from drying out. They have lungs so that they can breathe. And they have ectothermic metabolism. Um, this means that sometimes we see snakes and lizard on sunny rocks. Um, reptiles have to maintain their body temperature by whenever they're cold, they have to get out in the sun to warm their bodies up. And whenever they're hot, they have to get in the shade to cool their bodies down. We as mammals don't have to do that. Our, our body temperature stays relatively the same unless we're sick and we have a fever. Our body will regulate its own temperature by sweating um, to keep us cool. We also have a layer of fat in our skin to keep us warm, but reptiles have to change positions in their environment to try to keep their temperature normal. Dinosaurs, the most diverse reptiles, include some of the largest animals ever to live on land. They may have been endothermic, which is what we are. They may have been able to maintain their own body temperature internally, which is what that means. They died about 65 million years ago, but left birds as descendants. So here is a lizard. This is one of our reptile representatives. You can see it has claws. It has a scaly, non moist non moist skin unlike the salamanders here are the dinosaurs look very much like like the lizards of today but of course much larger birds are feathered reptiles with adaptations for flight so this is a prehistoric bird and you can see that it looks similar to what the dinosaurs used to look like which is why scientists are now saying birds are part of the um, reptile group. Nearly every part of the body of most birds reflects adaptations that enhance flight. Um, they have weight reducing features such as few teeth but strong light bones. They have feathers and large powerful breast muscles for flight. Endothermic metabolism, that means they maintain their own body temperature and a very effective circulatory system and wonderful vision.
Birds have large brains and very complex behaviors. The male and female cooperate in raising young and they migrate. Birds are able to migrate. There are a few flightless species of birds that still exist. For example, the emu or the ostrich. There's an emu. Very big bird. Mammals, so this is the group we belong to. Mammals are amniotes that have hair and produce milk. Um, <clears throat> the main features of mammals are hair. So anything that has hair is considered a mammal and it provides us with insulation. Um, you may know that there are many marine mammals like dolphins and whales. And you might say to yourself, dolphins and whales don't have hair. Well, actually they do. If we get close to a dolphin or a whale, they have hairy whiskers around their snouts. So that counts as hair. We, all mammals have mammary glands that produce milk. Birds don't breastfeed, we know that. Lizards don't breastfeed, but mammals do. They have endothermic metabolism, which means they maintain their own body temperature. Very efficient respiratory and circulatory systems and differentiation of teeth for different foods, meaning we have different kind of teeth that help us with different kinds of foods. For example, back far in your mouth are the molars, which are flat and they're adapted for chewing nuts, seeds, and grinding other things. And then our front teeth, the incisors and the cuspids, the little vampire teeth we have in the front, those are good at tearing and slashing meats or breaking off a celery stalk. So because of our different types of teeth, we're able to eat different types of food. We have a large brain, long period of parental care that allows for learning, so our young is able to learn. And these are all mammals, okay? There are three main groups of living mammals. We have first the monotremes. Monotremes lay eggs. There are two examples um, we have listed here, the echidna, and the duck-billed platypus that we saw at the beginning. Um, the duck-billed platypus kind of looks like a bird and it lays eggs, but it has all other mammalian features, hair, a uterus that it develops its young in, even though they're in eggs, um, and it, it breastfeeds. We also have marsupials. Marsupials carry their embryos in the placenta within the uterus but they complete development outside the mother's body. Um, for example, we know that kangaroos, um, once their little embryos start developing, the embryo actually leaves the body and crawls into the pouch where it, where it completes its development. Eutherians are placental mammals, and that's what we are. Eutherians complete their development completely before they're born, and that's what we are. We, our babies complete their, their development in, totally before they're born. So here's a duck-billed platypus, a monotreme. This is a mammal um, that lays eggs. It has hair, it breastfeeds, it does all the other, it has endothermic abilities, it maintains its own body temperature. Um, but it lays eggs, which is what makes it a little different than the traditional mammal like we are. Here's a marsupial that develops um, its baby in a pouch. So the baby starts development as an embryo and then it actually leaves the placenta and crawls into the pouch where it develops fully before it's born. And then this is a eutherian, which is what we are and we develop totally within the placenta before we are born. So when we're born, we're completely ready to go, ready to survive. We don't have any more development to do other than learning and growing. And this concludes chapter 18 on animals.